coming up. Cyclone Freddy killed hundreds of people in Southern Africa, but one of the continent's most destructive storms that now holds the record for the most accumulated cyclone energy in history isn't done yet. Malawi is going through uh, the worst cholera outbreak the country has ever faced. And the latest IPCC report warns of a climate ticking time bomb with more human suffering on the way. It's almost like we've been watching a disaster movie unfold in slow motion. Some cacti can live for up to 200 years. How are they such survivors? And often in regions with little rain, their secrets revealed. And imagine living in a country where the air is so bad, you have to wear a mask every time you go out. Some of the dirtiest air on the planet circulates in Delhi. But why and what's being done for a city with high rates of pollution-related lung cancer, diabetes, and premature births? Is this problem, this dirty air in India, a problem that's too big for the government to fix? This is Just Two Degrees on TRT World. Devine, welcome to the program. Well, let's get right into it with a major warning from the World Health Organization. In the aftermath of Cyclone Freddy, the body says there's an increased public health risk. In Africa, outbreaks of cholera have been reported in 12 nations across the continent. It is one of several diseases on the rise since the storm hit Malawi, Madagascar, and Mozambique. And keep in mind, Freddy was a record-setting system that began in February and lingered in the region for more than a month. Malawi, arguably the hardest hit among the three countries, was already battling a deadly cholera outbreak before the storm hit. We've shipped nearly 184 tons of laboratory treatment and other critical medical supplies to boost the cholera outbreak response. And we've decentralized this response operation to hotspots districts. We've also trained more than 1,500 health workers in the three affected countries on disease surveillance, on clinical care, community mobilization to secure public support for their response. In late March, the United Nations published a so-called survival guide for humanity. Thousands of scientists, all part of the intergovernmental panel on climate change, have distilled five years of work and presented some key points they say could help soften the very worst effects of the climate crisis. Dominic has those details. Humans are responsible for virtually all global heating over the last 200 years. The rate of temperature rise in the last half century is the highest in 2000 years. Concentrations of carbon dioxide are at their highest in at least two million years. The climate time bomb is ticking. You may have heard all this before, but the latest warnings from the United Nations are alarming nonetheless. A report by Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has outlined looming threats and what it calls a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. The rapid and sustained emissions reductions and accelerated adaptation action is required in this decade to address climate change. We are working when we should be sprinting. The panel made up of thousands of climate scientists say that to stay on course of the Paris Accord and avoid global temperature rise above 1.5 degrees Celsius, greenhouse gas emissions must be halved by mid-2030s. So the future really is in our hands. We will in all probability reach around one and a half degrees early next decade. But after that, it really is our choices. This is why this, the rest of this decade is key. The rest of this decade is whether we can apply the brakes and stop the warming at that level. But we are already way off track. The planet has already warmed by 1.1 degrees. Despite that, the IPCC says we can still meet temperature targets, but only if we switch to green energy, change consumer diets, and avoid high emission forms of transportation. And young people are leading the charge to ensure there is a planet for them in the future. The youth are the political force now that is more powerful 
we hope, than the oil companies and other industrial actors who are not paying attention to these warnings. Investors are beginning to pay attention because they see their investments going down the toilet if they don't shift to the cleaner energy future. People like Kenya's Elizabeth Watuti, Brazil's Sai Surui, and Sweden's Greta Thunberg, they say, after all, they are the ones who will pay the price for the negligence of the past. I wish that the society and the politics understand that it's about our survival on this planet, that we can't do it as much as before. Today, the Agency of International Energy, like the GIEC or the ONU, calls to stop all new projects on the exploitation of fossil fuels. Parce que ça n'est plus possible, le danger pour la planète est imminent, c'est-à-dire que si on continue comme ça, on arrivera à minimum à 3 degrés en 2100. Et ça, c'est une catastrophe à la fois pour la, pour la, pour la, pour la nature et pour l'humanité. When we look at the business plans of the fossil fuel industries worldwide, the vast majority of them plans to expand their business. Yet the International Energy Agency, the IPCC, the science is very clear. There cannot be any fossil fuel expansion happening anywhere. 16% of the world's population are teenagers, and more than a third are under the age of 20. Using social media, disruptive protests, and rallies at government offices, young people are leveraging their influence. Dominic Branomondi, just two degrees. We've got Sharon George here in Just Two Degrees. She's extremely knowledgeable on environmental sustainability and green technology. She's a senior lecturer at Keele University in the United Kingdom. Professor, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. So this IPCC report, there isn't much here, to my, in my opinion, that we haven't heard before. What in this report most grabbed your attention? I think... The, the language has started to change uh, to a much more urgent message. So this is not, like as you say, this isn't a new thing we've been saying. And for, for, for a scientist working in the field, it's almost like we've been watching um, a disaster movie unfold in slow motion. But, but we've, we've, because of the way that we calculate how climate change will unfold and the causes behind climate change, we're talking probabilities. And because that language hasn't necessarily been strong enough in the past, and, and you know, I think the fact that we're talking about, you know, invisible gases that are somehow going to affect us in the future, it's been really hard to galvanise that action. But now we are starting to really see that evidence ramp up. We're seeing more floods and we're seeing much more evidence in terms of drought and, and heat waves. And this is starting to now impact people's lives and economies around the world. And, and indirectly through when we do see natural disasters, they are so much worse because there's no resilience in the systems there to absorb these shocks that we're seeing caused by climate change. And I think this is this is what we're seeing now reflected in this report is that urgency um, that that we we you know we we have run out of time we haven't got you know the uh, any any time every every moment that we waste kind of thinking about this now and talking about this has gone we we should have done this decades ago and now we need to take that action otherwise the the damage will be irreparable. Yeah, indeed, this, this report underscores the fact that if things stay the course, the way they've been going, we will see a lot more human suffering, a lot more yeah. uh, species will go extinct. I'd like to focus on the people for a second. A child born today, Doctor, um, what do you think the world will be like for that child when, say, in 25 years' time? OK, so already we're starting to see impact and in, in stresses in our food chains. We're seeing um, biodiversity crashing because the strain on our environment. But we're also seeing these impacts impact, uh, having an effect on things like food prices. So by the time we come to 25 years' time, we will have seen sea levels rise. We'll have seen pressure on agricultural land that's become inundated. We have see groundwater becoming saline because of that ingress of seawater. And we see, you know, much more, um, much more, 
fire, much more drought, much more pressure on the land. Mm -hmm. So to live economically is going to become harder and harder for that child as they grow up. Things will be much more expensive. Things mm -hmm. are just going to be difficult. All right. We'll have to leave it there. Unfortunately, Doctor, I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here in Just Two Degrees. No problem. Here's some interesting news. European leaders have discussed a dispute over the bloc's planned phase-out of carbon-emitting uh, cars. Lawmakers approved a law in February to ban the sale of fossil fuel cars from 2035, but a number of countries have disagreed on the date, and some have been one round to using electric vehicles. I think, for example, with regard to the motors at combustion interne, we don't hesitate now. We've taken the direction of going towards an electrification rapid of our transport. We have a lot of expertise in our hands. I think we don't hesitate now and not ask the questions and try to change the strategy. The strategy is good. We can take the lead in there. We need to continue to do it. For many people, a little cactus in a pot. It's a thoughtful gift despite the thorns, but cacti are a massive family of flowering plants with two to 3,000 different species all adapted to thrive in sweltering heat. Without them, desert environments and the animals that inhabit them would not easily survive. Cacti are native to North and South America and their leaves and trunks store water in desert regions. That makes them a vital resource for animals including deer, quail, wild turkey, rabbits and turtles in areas that receive little rain. Cacti fruit and nectar also feed many insects and birds. The flowers as food are vital to the success of hummingbird migration across the desert. Since prehistoric times, humans have relied on cacti too. We eat the fruit and stems of the prickly pear cactus and feed it to cattle and other livestock. Some species are even used as fencing to keep up predators. Indigenous people in Mexico and the American Southwest use prickly pear juice to treat wounds and rashes. Others use cactus extracts in religious ceremonies. And some species are being studied for modern medicinal use. The popularity of cacti as houseplants has led to poaching in the wild, leading many species to become endangered. Humans have also created problems by introducing some into ecosystems where they're not native and where they become invasive, taking up already scarce water resources, otherwise used by domestic species. And here to speak with us about just how important cacti really are is conservation ecologist and nursery owner, Mihail Pellet out of Tucson, Arizona in the US. Mihail, thank you so much, welcome to the show. Firstly, let's talk about the cacti's characteristic spikes. Exactly what's the function? Um, well, a lot of people think they're for defense, the and um, that's definitely the case. Um, a, a lot of people don't want to interact too closely with cacti if they don't have to. But the, the spines also serve the functions of uh, reducing um, heat by uh, reflecting sunlight, as well as capturing water in some situations. So uh, they're a very, uh, very special adaptation that serves multiple purposes. Uh, let's talk about uh, the ability to store water. Where exactly does the water come from, particularly in places where there's little to zero rainfall? So we have this uh, common perception of cacti as only living in um, very dry deserts, but that, that's not entirely accurate. There are um, cacti that live as far north as Canada, um, as well as species that occur in rainforests. So their water requirements definitely vary, but what all cacti share is that they live in environments that are dry, uh, at least seasonally. And there's often a lot of uh, uh, variability between years in how much water falls. So um, water does typically come from rainfall, with exceptions uh, in deserts where some species rely on coastal fog. Are you basically saying as well that uh, different cacti, maybe all cacti, uh, can adjust to different soil types. Yes, uh, what you definitely see in cacti is that there's a uh, specialization to different types of soil. And so in some cases, it's not very clear to us if cacti live in a very, um, well, harsh environments simply because they like it there or maybe because they do better than other species there. So we, we're not sure in all cases why they exist where they exist. Okay, so what about the amount of life that cacti support? Just how important are these plants 
wherever they are? So it very much so depends on the species, but uh, one iconic uh, one is the saguaro cactus, which occurs in the American Southwest here in states like uh, Arizona, where I, uh, I am located. And uh, so some of these species support uh, pretty much the entire ecosystem from uh, insects to mammals to birds uh, to other plant species. And so really they're interconnected with hundreds of other species in their ecosystems. And so their disappearance could uh, um, have a tremendous negative impact on the rest of that ecosystem. Uh, just a, a, a question here. I'm not too sure if it's a silly question or not, but I, um, do cacti absorb carbon and release oxygen like other plants do? Yes, so um, pretty much all plants have that in common. And um, in the case of cacti, of course, how much carbon they can store varies. But um, in systems where there's very little in the way of trees that are um, traditionally um, make up a bigger proportion of the carbon stored in those systems, yes, cacti can definitely take over that role in some of the ecosystems that they inhabit, especially when we're talking about very large kilometer species. So um, there's been no good estimates of quite how much carbon cacti store around the world, but uh, that's definitely an important research avenue. Imagine living in a country where the air is so bad, you have to wear a mask every time you go out. Well, many of us don't know what that's like, but it's the norm in places like China and Pakistan. Here's Dominic. Some of the dirtiest air on the planet can be found here in Lahore. It's nicknamed Pakistan's city of gardens, but the smog here is so thick it disrupts flights, causes major road closures, and wreaks havoc on the health of residents. It's no surprise Lahore is considered the most polluted city in the world. Lahore is um, successively now uh, one of the most polluted cities in the world. And the reason for that is pretty much vehicular emissions. Uh, more than anything, it's vehicular emissions and industrial emissions. Uh, uh, we, have, we have a very large population and an equivalent number of cars, a very poor public transportation system, one not running on clean fuel either. Uh, the existing system doesn't run on clean fuel. We have a lot of power plants and industries surrounding Lahore. So smog is a perennial issue in Pakistan. But the problem isn't limited to Pakistan. Research by IQ Air a Swiss air quality technology company has identified the five most polluted countries in 2022. On top of the list, Chad. The WHO says on an annual basis, just five micrograms of small particulate matter or PM 2.5 cubic meter of air is the maximum safe level. IQ Air found Chad's average was 89.7. Coming in second was Iraq at 80.1 micrograms per cubic meter. The main causes, burning of fossil fuels for energy, the high polluting brick and cement industries, and public use of small generators. Pakistan placed third at 70.9. Bahrain, a major oil exporting state, recorded 66.6, 13 times the WHO's safe limit. And in fifth place, Bangladesh with 65.8. The 2022 World Air Quality Report has been compiled from data provided by over 30,000 air quality monitoring stations in 131 countries. This includes government stations like the one behind me that monitor air quality to ensure compliance with the country's air quality regulations. These stations are very expensive and often few and far between. With recent advances in sensor and internet technology, it is now possible to measure some of the most harmful pollutants, like PM2.5, with much smaller, easier to use air quality monitors. PM2.5 particles are tiny microns that are generated mainly through human activity, such as smoking and the burning of coal. Researchers say long-term exposure to these chemicals can lead to heart attacks, asthma, and worse. IQ Air says that in 2022, only six countries met the WHO PM2.5 guidelines of five micrograms or lower, making it clear that the pollution problem is a global one. Dominic Brianomondi, just two degrees. And with us today to talk about the problem of pollution from the Brula Institute of Technology and Science in Polani, India, Professor 
Rajiv Kumar Chaturvedi. Professor, always good seeing you. Uh, Dominic Veer talked a lot about pollution in Pakistan, but we've heard a lot in the news about India's pollution. How do people get by there every day? Uh, so pollution, as you see, it is, uh, uh, there's a new report that talks about the pollution that is there almost in all parts of the world. So India is also suffering from the problem of pollution. South Asia is one of the highly polluted areas. So when we talk about pollution, we have uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, NOx, uh, PM10 particles, and particulate matter 2.5 particles. So these PM2.5 particles that are coming largely from the industrial activities, largely from the human uh, activities, these are the ones which are the most deadly and uh, these cause the health related issues. So in India also, we are, uh, like there, are, there have been some studies which talk about the bad effect of air pollution on uh, human health. So I think this is a problem that is now prevalent almost mm. all over the world. And India is also suffering from this problem. And yeah. uh, what I feel as the economies will grow from uh, developing, like a develop, developing economy to a developed economy, the pollution levels will, uh, will surely come down uh, with the economic growth in the country. Yeah, I want to mention that a bit. I mean, the report has listed the top polluting, the top uh, cities and where pollution is highest are countries in Southeast Asia, Africa as well. What is it about these cities um, where they just can't cope with these levels of, of, of air debris? Of course, actually, uh, as you see, uh, air pollution is largely local phenomena. So, uh, like uh, incomplete combustion, so as you see from the vehicular emissions. So, if the vehicle standards are not really of very high standard, then the emissions per vehicle, emissions per kilometer traveled by the vehicles will be high. So uh, this is the problem when the countries, the geographies that are poor, that are, uh, so they tend to have higher uh, sort of uh, emissions because the combustion uh, of uh, fuel, the combustion of uh, different uh, materials, mm -hmm. biomass, etc., takes place uh, not in a very efficient manner there. This is one of the reasons uh, that uh, I think, uh, is a reason why uh, the um, the the poorer geographies are witnessing this kind uh, of uh, professor pro quick question is this problem this dirty air in india a problem that's too big for the government to fix uh, so the air pollution uh, of course is a big problem here uh, in india as well as you have shown uh, as is the case in other geographies however what i feel that uh, uh, there are roadmaps that are being uh, put in place. There are uh, policies that are being put in place. Uh, so some success has also been witnessed. Uh, so you can see in India, especially in the northern India, the air pollution is linked with the, the winter season. Okay. And it is also often associated with the stubble burning. So on that front, some success has been achieved. Some uh, this year, it has been uh, like we have seen uh, a scenario, especially in the stubble burning case where it was much controlled compared to the earlier uh, years. So we are optimistic. We uh, view that things are going to go All right. better from this point onwards. Okay, Professor Rajiv Kumar Chaturvedi, thank you so much, as usual, for coming on the program. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And that is how we end this edition of Just Two Degrees. Before we go, look at these climate activists in the Spanish province of Malaga. They protested on the cracked ground of the La Vinuela Reservoir, which was at 10% capacity after severe drought. All this to mark World Water Day on March 22nd. Hope to see you next time. Bye.